present here because I'm a software guy. And we are friendly. <laughs> Shukong is a bit more of a hardware. I'm, I'm really more of a software guy. And presenting to you guys seems like uh, kind of nerve working for me. So forgive me about that. So let me just give a very really quick introduction about myself, then introduce Shupeng as well. I uh, work for PayPal. Like, obviously, this is not my day job. <laughs> uh, before this, I worked in HP, um, in HP Labs, and also in Yahoo. Uh, I love Ruby, and I've been developing in Ruby about 10 years. Uh, and before that, about 11 years in Java. So everything software. I wrote a number of books in Ruby, so these are some of the books. And uh, the last Ruby book I wrote was this one, Exploring Everyday Things with R and Ruby, uh, translated in Japanese, Chinese, and Korean. Uh, uh Hi, this is Shi Peng. Uh, I work in PayPal as well. Uh, and here are some open source projects I've been working on. Uh, this is MiniQ, it is a code copter. Uh, and this is Jack Duno, it is a device that you can plug into your phone and do uh, data transmission to your circuit. Uh, and this is uh, Cashew, it is a 3D uh, sketching software that I've been working on, so it's really easy to use it to uh, sketch your ideas and turn it into 3D models. Uh, pass it back to Saoxiang about the hardware part. So I will attempt to talk about the hardware. So it's more of a journey. We sort of got this idea to uh, build a robot about four, five months ago. Uh, and we wanted to present in the Ruby conference. So that's <coughs> why you see a lot of these things coming up. It's uh, very Ruby focused. Uh, and to be frank, originally I thought it would be quite easy. Uh, but actually we spent, or at least I spent most of the time on the hardware than on the software. So when we first got the idea of building this robot, um, we wanted to try something different from the ordinary. So what we did was we went around searching for what to build, right? So one of the first things we found was this neat looking robot that we found on eBay. And uh, I thought it was pretty cool. It's called Torobot by a Chinese manufacturer. Um, very sleek looking little bot so, and we wanted to get it. Uh, we did a little bit of digging around and then we realized that it is actually a clone of this Lynx. <laughs> Motion Phoenix, which is a uh, robotics company in US. Um, very nice. So we thought, which one should we get? And we checked around the prices. <laughs> <laughs> um, so obviously, we all know which one we ended up with. Right? Um, so we got the Toro bot, and then after that, we went around shopping. Uh, we bought stuff from 2Xtreme, from Q10, from eBay, from RS Online. Uh, Basically, everywhere we could lay our hands in, we could sort of like search around the internet where we could find stuff. Uh, some of the stuff that we bought, we bought the uh, MG995 uh, servo. It's about six bucks each. This is the uh, servo. We use the 32 channel servo controller, also from Torobot. <coughs> this has a power for the servo controller, uh, power for the servos themselves, the transmit and uh, receive, as well as the outputs to the servos. To power the servo controller, um, got this from uh, Marina Square, right? So they were giving premiums and somehow, so I just got one um, after buying certain amounts and got one. So this is free. Uh, we also got some power packs for the uh, servos. So this is two bucks, this is about one dollar for the plastic itself and about uh, two sing dollars for the four alkaline batteries from Daiso. Uh, so, so about two dollars for four double A size alkaline batteries. So we thought, okay, one power pack is about uh, 1,500 milliamp hours. Maybe not, maybe not so good. So let's, let's get three, right? So we've got three, it's two times three, six bucks. That's not too bad. And then we jumped into building the robot, right? So we, we uh, started with building the legs. Uh, each leg is actually has three degrees of freedom. So three servos per leg. It's modeled after an insect leg segment. So uh, it has the coxa, the femur, and the tibia. <coughs> tibia. These are some of the pictures taken as we were building. So this is a coxa and femur. 
This is the, the actual femur. This is the tibia. Then we put them all together. So all three in one. And as you see, each one of them has a wire coming out the uh, servo connector. It has uh, red, black for the power and the ground. Orange is a signal. Okay. Then we attach the leg into the controller. And we have the controller controlling one leg. Of course, we did this six times, you have six legs. So how do we power it? How, what's the brains behind this guy? We use the Raspberry Pi. It just came out at a point in time. It's, uh, I think it's 35 bucks each. Paid about 50 over dollars for one of them. Uh, this is the GPL. We ended up using the uh, transmit and receive, the GPL 14 and 15. And to put our code into the Raspberry Pi, uh, basically what we did was to use a Wi-Fi adapter. Got this uh, nine bucks through RS Online. Now we put a lick and the servo controller <coughs> powered by the uh, uh, Raspberry Pi. So this is a picture of that. We put things together, assembled them. This is how it looks like. And finally, we have the assembled hexapod. This is version one, right? It looks kind of uh, uh, okay, I suppose. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> whatever. So um, then we started powering it up. Here you go, here's a video of it. This is my room, actually. Oh, it works. Okay, great. So let's get it moving. Same robot. Okay, so not bad. It's moving, but it's actually not going anywhere. So <laughs> trying to figure out what happened is why is it not actually moving. So after a while, we thought maybe it doesn't have enough power. Right, so uh, we did some. We went back to look at some of the uh, specifications. So this servo is 250 milliamps when it's no load, and one to two amps when it's under load. So that means for the 12, 12 servos is about 18 amps, and the six servos that are basically the coxa, it's about 2.7 amps because it's not really doing anything much when it's standing. So it's about 21 amps. Uh, six volts is 126 watts to just make this guy stand, right? So let's look at our power packs. We took a power pack, we measured the current and the voltage. It's about seven watts each. So seven times three, 21 watts. Obviously not enough, right? So what should we do next? Okay, so went around searching some more. Uh, found this guy, three cell lipo, so <coughs> volts, uh, 1,600 milliamp hour battery. Okay, let's take a look at that. Times 20C is 32 amps, so 32 times 7.4 is 237 watts. That's more than what we need. Great, so it should be working. All right, let's go do it. Uh, we did some fancy soldering. I have not soldered in 22 years. <laughs> I actually dug out from one of my uh, packages that's left behind. Uh, tried to solder a bit. This is my ruler. This is my stuff. I could not actually do it. So in the end, I had to pass the ship on me. Like he's uh, <laughs> better at, than me. So we put everything together, and then it exploded. Right. Um, yeah. So smoke actually came out from the servos, and uh, I madly scrambled to the robot, unplugged the thing. Realize what happened. Actually, I didn't realize immediately, right? I thought, okay, something really screwed up. Uh, but really, what happened was, if I look carefully at this, I thought it was two cells, 7.4 volts, right? Uh, actually, it's three cells, 11.1 volts. And obviously, the max operating range for the <laughs> server was 7.2 volts. Um, not a good idea. And I burnt eight servos. <laughs> It's really bad. <laughs> That's screw up again. So yeah, I'm just telling you about my screw ups, right? Yeah. Um, again, did more investigation. You can realize how much time we actually took in between, right? So in between slides, it's not sub second. <laughs> it took a lot of time to do this. Uh, we got a voltage regulator. Of course, we did some more stuff, uh, more fancy soldering. Um, and then we thought we could do it. But actually, as it turns out, the Raspberry Pi was not as stable as we thought it was. Right? 
Uh, there were some issues with it. There were actually many issues with it. One of the issues was that connectivity, uh, the Wi-Fi adapter somehow was not stable. Uh, it didn't work properly. It crashed my SD card a couple of times. So it crashed it, it reformatted it, uh, downloaded Raspberry, Raspbian, reinstalled Raspbian. But the worst part of it was installing Ruby. So I think that took like, I don't know, half a day to just install Ruby in that guy. I have no idea why till today. But, uh, did you compile it from scratch? Or I compiled it from scratch. Uh, that could be it. Make this Raspbian packages for Ruby. Um, I wanted the later uh, Ruby. Ah. Yeah, so. then, then he still may try to package it. <coughs> so we basically could downloaded the, the, the latest package from, say, Ubuntu, and you rebuild it for Raspbian. Yeah. So. And you uh, can even cross rebuild it. I, I, I think some people may have it on Launchpad already. So. It, I did, so it took me half a day to actually do it. And I wasn't sure what happened, right? So you can imagine, it took such a long time, I thought it hung, what happened to it, and then I shut it down. I tried again and again. But anyway, that wasn't really the big problem. The problem is that it's really unstable, because uh, sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. So in the end, we like, okay, this, is, this will not do, right? So we need to do something better. Uh, what we did, in fact, was in the end to just tear out the Raspberry Pi, say, look, forget the Raspberry Pi. I'll power it from my computer. So the computer sends a signal to the uh, Bluetooth adapter, uh, which is connected to the server controller, right? So screw the Raspberry Pi, I'll power it for my Mac, it will work. And there we go. Here, yeah. so that's the end result of version 2. Oh. It sounds better because it's sound here. <laughs> Conference people, they have no idea why I say my thing is success because it doesn't be anything. So, that was. So, that was that. Um, after, after that, after making it work properly, you can actually work properly, started tweaking it. So, version 3 now has padded feet because it was just too noisy, it was waking up everybody. Uh, I did it at night mostly, right? So you can imagine it's quite loud at night. Uh, build a case because the power, the batteries keep tumbling down. I used rubber band, it didn't work properly. So in the end, I built a, uh, you can see I built a cardboard case for it. Did you have no problem with batteries heating? Uh, so what happened was that uh, I sort of skipped some other screw up, right? Because ran out of uh, <laughs> number of pictures I can put. <laughs> um, so I burnt the servos again another time. And that was because the, the battery overheated and it burnt the servos again. And I blame it on the weather, it was quite hot then. You know, but I don't know why we burnt the servos again. Um, so right now what we try to do is try to actually not use the, uh, not to run the robot too long. Right? Just keep it within a minute or two minutes. Let it walk around a little bit, then quickly shut it down, let it cool and then start it up again. Yeah. But more importantly, we did something else which we'll show you later, um, how we get, get over some of these problems. So, build a case. And this is version 3. At rest, stretching its legs, ready to go. I have one more video of uh, this guy. That was the TV. Not as noisy. Not sure whether you realize the pads, what they were. They're actually the uh, pens, the pen, the rubber pads on the pen. We finish using the pen, so yeah. plug it out and stuff it in. <laughs> Hello world. <laughs> That was the hardware. Let's talk about the software, uh, an area I'm a little bit more comfortable with. So obviously, um, as I mentioned earlier on, the control is through a Bluetooth, through Bluetooth via my uh, laptop. Uh, send a signal to the Bluetooth adapter, which goes to the, the legs. And this is how we control the servos. So for controlling one servo, you send this string across. Uh, one P here means this is the channel. 1500, this is the rotation, the amount of rotation. And this is the speed. So this is for controlling one servo. If I want to control, 
control three servos together. So this is servo one, servo two, and servo three. Sending out a string of uh, commands to the servos, all three servos at the same time. And of course, um, being a Rubyist, first thing you do is you create a library, right? You create a library to control the robot. And uh, basically what I did was a model of the servos. Here's a model of the servo. Um, the servo channel and how much to rotate. It returns a string. I model the, uh, the leg as well. And actuating the leg, meaning that um, actuating it to the um, amount of uh, degrees of movement, is a little bit more primitive because they are better <coughs> algorithms. I'm sure some of you might know, uh, like inverse kinematic, which I actually tried, but um, in the end, because we faced so much problems with the hardware itself, I thought you know just having a simpler uh, model for the the software might make it work better. <coughs> and this is converting left and right. So the left and right is a difference of 180 degrees. Okay. So um, Shubham will talk about the physics simulation. Uh, okay, so I'll be talking about the physics simulation of Hexabot. Uh, so one of the problem we were having is uh, the Hexabot robot itself is very heavy. It's not easy to carry it around and the battery gets drained pretty fast. So uh, we thought it would be easier for us to do development with some kind of uh, physics simulator. So we can just run an application on the la laptop and uh, we can debug and do development on the uh, with the uh, simulator. So I create this uh, Hexbot sim, uh, this project. Uh, it is a physics simulator for Hexbots. Uh, so first, let me show you a demo of how it works. Um, so what we need to do is to uh, <coughs> telnet to 555 TCP port and then we can send the uh, servo controller commands to uh, the uh, simulator so let's say if I uh, want to move servo number one I just type this you can see the servo is moving and we can also move multiple servos at the same time uh, as you just uh, use this kind of command you can control the two legs over there and also you can drag it around to see uh, what's happening or you want to do some debugging so uh, here is the flow for uh, the simulator uh, first uh, we send uh, the servo controller command uh, through TCP port uh, to our simulator and then we we'll use this command to uh, update the bullet physics engine and once we uh, get these commands and update the positions and rotations of each object we have in the uh, physics world, we can use this to update the OpenGL renderer to show the uh, movement uh, of each object in the thing. And uh, to do a physics simulation, uh, basically we just need to define uh, four items. Uh, the first one is the uh, dynamics world. So uh, you create this world, you can add different objects to it to do physics simulation. And next is uh, you need to define the shapes for each body part you have. Uh, like uh, each leg has three body parts, so you need to define all the body part. And you also need to tie these uh, shapes you define with uh, a, a rigid body. And for each leg, it's uh, we have three servos on each leg, so you need to add constraints for these uh, servos as well to make sure everything is moving correctly. Uh, this is how to create the shapes. Uh, this part is kind of easy. Uh, I just need to create some box shape for the body and the uh, uh, capture shape for the legs. And here's how you create the rigid bodies. And the last part is to add the constraints. So. Uh, this is a leg. Uh, it has three axes. It can rotate. So we can model it as a hinge constraint. So what we need to do is we just need to define the uh, uh, transformation matrix for body one and body two. And with this, we know how to uh, how the constraint is, and uh, we can add the constraint by 
uh, code like this. Uh, so, for example, I want to uh, add a constraint for body A and body B. We just need to uh, do something like this, and then the constraint is there. And I pass back to Sashaun for all together. Okay, so um, we have the hardware. We can control each leg. We have a simulator to do it now. So all it takes now to actually is to make the, the robot move the, the way that we want. So how do we do it? Um, <coughs> we actually model the movement of the hexapod based on the movement of an ant. Uh, it's called a tripod gate. And obviously the reason why it's called a tripod gate is because it's walking this way. It's walking three legs at the same time. Right? So you notice the ant is actually just walking. So its running gait is something different, but the tripod gait looks pretty elegant, so that's what we model. Uh, this is how it looks like, six-legged tripod gait. We use this and build the, the script. Uh, we'll show you the script. forgot about this. So this is the hexapod script that we used to do what you saw just now, which is basically make some movement and then after that uh, wave. Uh, defining the legs, so defining the front, middle, back legs, and then defining the, the three legs. These are the left legs, the front, left, middle, right, and back left, and the right legs, front, right, middle, left, and back right. right? So it's moving the legs, lift leg up and actuating it this way so tripod movement step one step two step three step four uh, so this is walking the gate and uh, some other <coughs> motions which did not show and uh, this is just waving right just waving three <laughs> times I right, just live up and then just three times then move down quite simple this is actually or relatively trivial And this is all together now with the uh, simulator. Right. The simulator it actually runs the, sorry, the, uh, the script. I just run it, and then if I type in the uh, IRB, I just say walk, you will walk. <laughs> and uh, I say, all legs, it should calibrate. So, and all legs, it should tiptoe. Right. So, the idea is to have this library. Um, of course, the library. The idea is not like to actually control the robot by typing. The idea is that having this library. You can incorporate it into whichever programs that you want to run, and therefore you can control the robot. So that, that's the idea behind it. Right. So this is where we are today. Um, we have not done anything much more in between, so really just begun. There are a lot more other things that we wanted to do. Uh, for example, the Raspberry Pi, still not giving up on it. Um, we wanted better servos because the servo we used was the six buck servo. The Lynx motion servos are actually between forty to sixty dollars, so I suppose there must be a reason why it's that way. <laughs> um, yeah. When we put in sensors, we didn't actually have, uh, we didn't actually put in sensors because we sort of plugged out the uh, Raspberry Pi. There's nothing to, to plug the sensors in. So, so after you put in the Raspberry Pi, we want to put in sensors. We want to try out different form factors. We want to try out uh, a bipad, right? And uh, we want to try different materials as well. So in between waiting for the servos to be delivered, the, the burnt servos, so you need to actually go and purchase online. Uh, wait, waiting for it to be delivered, sort of play around with something else as well. So I did this, a uh, strider uh, made from cardboard. This is a uh, strider. So same concept, um, made from cardboard. It's a quad prepared. It has four legs only. 
because not enough power to power the whole thing. And uh, cardboard, the bipad robot. <laughs> so how we did it, we cycled cardboard, set the legs, sticking in some rows, the two legs, attach the body, this is the lower body, and we have cardboard. So this is a cardboard. <laughs> uh, my cardboard cutting skills are not excellent, so <laughs> it's actually stumbling on itself, right? Uh, so, yeah, I think can probably build better variations of it. And cardboard is probably not the best material to build robots with, so. Uh, it, it does a lot better than some of the robots in the DARPA challenge. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So um, the library I have is actually a very simple library. Uh, there are other libraries. So Argus is the one that's created by Jim Weirich. Um, and uh, he uses it to drive drones. And then there's R2, of course. So R2 is the same, is built by the same guy who did the uh, Cylon, if, and as well as uh, GoBot, right? So the same guys who did this, they did it in three different languages. It has a variety of uh, things that you can do with it. Unfortunately, my biggest gripe with these guys is that uh, they tried to do so many things, they couldn't actually keep up with the pace of the upgrade. So some of the, uh, the drivers and stuff like that didn't work properly. So that's the presentation. Thank you. I don't really have any, I didn't actually bring the robot, so I think that was the first mistake. We just came in and thought, wow, such a, so many things on the table, we have nothing on the table at all. We didn't bring the robot. It was heavy and uh, that was my, that's my only excuse actually. Questions or suggestions or thoughts? How long does the battery last? If you want to, let's say, make you know, raise them or something like that. How long does it last? So we didn't really test. I was actually a bit paranoid after it, it blew. Uh, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't really try to make it run as long as possible. Yeah. It actually burned up twice. Uh, the first time because I overloaded the servos. Mm -hmm. Second time, I think it overheated the servos. So the power drip, the power load actually overheated the servos, I think. And it then it, it sort of burnt and it just died. So didn't really test out how long the batteries would last. One charge basically lasted more than a few minutes. So three, uh, I think two years ago I bought uh, some in a shopping mall there was some promotion. Mm -hmm. I bought one, which is uh, $70. It's very plasticky. Mm -hmm. And actually, uh, I don't think, I didn't really actually open it yet, but the there's a lot of symmetry in, in, in the robot. So yeah. actually, maybe some of the servo, it, it tends to be, uh, maybe there, there could be some uh, option where you actually have uh, something that you know, becomes symmetric in, in, in your design. Right. That would save the servo. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I was going to say, you know, <laughs> it, 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 has, uh, it has this, uh, yeah, like, uh, you know, it, it throws some bullets. Yeah. And actually, underneath, there's a lot of mechanics. Yep. So yep. actually, the, when one leg moves, I think uh, it basically mirrors on the other side. So That's right. There's a lot so of simplification. It means um, so yes and no. I think that can be done. In fact, I've seen uh, hexapods with only twelve servos. So one of the servo very cleverly um, raises up the, the leg and move at the same time. So mm -hmm. it depends on the mechanics as well. But the uh, the, the movement is not as uh, elegant as if the ones with eighteen servos, right? Um, so there, there was a design sort of design decision that we took. Uh, that we wanted to have more servos in order to make it look cooler. So that, that was that. I think after this guy, probably we're going to experiment with a lot of different types of uh, robots and a lot of different designs and lots of different materials as well. So that's one I'm, I'm trying to re rework cardboard um, because the, the L-shaped hinge is made, was made of cardboard, so it sort of, sort of fell under after a while. I am looking at taking the, um, you know, the shelf hinge, the L-shaped hinge, and making that into a lake uh, and other stuff as well. I think there's lots of areas to explore here, uh, a lot of different possibilities. Should we have uh, like a competition when we have like a no Christmas deadline and then we can build and have some sort of way? <laughs> yeah. So, reminder we are, so, I mean, at least I'm more of a software guy, so I'm hoping to actually get more ideas from you guys, or at least some canvas, some help in case I sort of run into trouble again. Is there any specific reason why you? Started off with the bio mechanism, you know, you had the the insect inspired um, movement as well as the 
Is it, was there any reason why you did that or? or? Just look cool. <laughs> We we saw at least uh, we saw on on eBay and a few sites that this particular <laughs> robot looks really cool, and it requires eighteen uh, servos. But then after that we look around for some other robots, and somehow it didn't look as good as the one the first one we saw. So we went with the first one, purely by looks alone. Just like you mentioned about the Raspberry Pi being scratchy, is it because of power system corruption or? Uh, so basically, one day the um, the SD card basically just did not run at all. Yeah, maybe you can consider changing the file system a bit only. Sorry. Is it, uh, changing the file system of the Raspberry Pi of the of the SD card to read only. To read only. Yeah. Yes, because that's a very common problem for Raspberry Pi. So but you, if it's read only, then I cannot. Yeah. Write. So whenever you need to make changes, you convert the back to write and to enable write. After you finish what you're doing, you convert back to read only. Oh. So okay. you can just power off without properly without needing to shut it down properly. I see, I see. Well, it could also be a power problem. Yes. Yeah. Power problem. Yeah. The less power supply, uh, that's why it's crashing your uh, network. Uh, I see, I see. The, the network because of yes. less power. The, the less power supply. You I can see. use a Model A. Because the Model A will use less power than the Model B. Okay. Mm -hmm. There's an easy way is to use two power supplies, one for Raspberry Pi and the other one just for the servers. Oh, which is what we're doing. He <laughs> has to do that. Because oh, okay. and, uh, and the in-between, you have better to work uh, off the class later. So that uh, there's no noise going to the Raspberry Pi side. Yeah, I think the server controller we're using have that part on it already. Yeah, we have. Uh, yeah. yeah. Separate, separate input so I can show you the... Uh, So there's one power for the servo controller, which mm -hmm. is um, mini USB, and the other one is for the servos. The servos is basically we just stuck wires in it. All right, maybe one last question. Yes. Why can't you use wood? <laughs> there's no reason why I can't use wood. I think um, I cannot use wood if no, I cannot use wood. I have not tried wood. <laughs> I have not tried wood. Actually, for an alternative for to cardboard, you can use balsa wood. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a good Somebody did suggest to me. Um, I'm not sure whether I think I'll be a lot worse with wood than with cardboard because you know. You, but I think it's a good, very good suggestion. Ask, we sold it like 22 years ago. When was the last time we sold a piece of wood? <laughs> <laughs> Probably in a previous life. <laughs> I've never, I've never sold wood before. Okay. Um, not, not, not really a question. But you, you're saying that, that Ruby takes like half a day to install, right? So like, which, whichever the case. The moment you, you get the SD card to a point that you think you would like to snapshot it, you, you should you need to save it to an image. Yeah. Use DD image. Yeah, you should DD the image yeah. out yeah. to your Mac or whatever. Then yeah. next time you want to restore, just DD again. Correct. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In fact, I did that. Um, in fact, I did that, but then there were other issues involved. That's why in the end it didn't really help. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed it. Uh, any other questions from any of you? So we hold the hackware. Uh, so the midweek, uh, we are shifting from midweek to the fourth week. So we will be having it in July fourth week, just because our statistics of the meetups in Singapore shows that midweek everybody's fighting. Today there are five events, by the way, and everyone is full, which is a good problem to have. Great problem, but uh, we are just trying to shift around things. Any last questions? If not, uh, all of you are welcome to come on the last week. Uh, please uh, come and contact us or drop a note in Facebook or meetup.com if you want to give a talk, a 20-minute talk slot. And uh, anything else, organizers? Engineers.sg? Thank you once again for recording the video. So if not, uh, mingle with uh, King Meng, uh, Xiao Xiong. Shipping, uh, Kritika, or any of you, and uh, we ended early so that we can kickstart the networking. See you next month. Thank you.